Hello, and welcome to the Next Level Supply Chain with GS1 US, a podcast in which we explore the mind-bending world of global supply chain, covering topics such as automation, innovation, unique identity, and more. I'm your co-host, Reed. And I'm Liz. And welcome to the show. Reed and I just had an amazing conversation with Sushal Buyan. We were having this great conversation that he starts to talk about probiotic DNA that they use to trace products through the supply chain. And this technology can also be used to address food safety. It's fascinating. All the things that they're doing with this technology, and it's not just tracking products through the supply chain using this probiotic DNA, but this also can be used for other uses, which he'll talk about in the podcast. He talked about a lack of traceability adoption to get ahead of food safety, which we all know is a huge topic right now, especially with the Food Safety Modernization Act or FISMA 204 coming down pipe. And this technology can be a way to do that. He talked about so many different pieces of technology and bioscience, things that I didn't even understand, but said it all in a way that really made so much sense. So please enjoy this podcast. Reed and I had a great time speaking with Vishal. Vishal, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me, Reed. We're glad that you can spend the time with us today. I remember meeting you three years ago at your uh, Brooklyn establishment. You guys are in Brooklyn. You're still in Brooklyn, right? That's right. We're actually in the same complex. So when you visit us, we had a small, like 400 square foot, half wet lab, half office space, if you want to call it that. And now we're expanding to 30,000 square feet in that same complex. So that's fantastic. All right. So let's jump into this because you had a different company name then. You're still doing the same work, but you know, you're a startup and it was intriguing for me to find out what you do. So let's jump into it today for our audience. And if you could, Maybe just give us a little background on yourself and what Annika does. So I actually spent most of my career in finance. Before launching Annika, I was a portfolio manager at a $3 billion hedge fund where I focus on credit derivatives and insurance linked derivatives. I actually co-authored three books with Financial Times and Wiley on different ways we can use insurance to address problems ranging from water scarcity to overfishing to demographic change. Long story short, I had an investment in a small CBG company that ran into not recalls, but sort of just supply chain issues where some of the core product or the key ingredients in this CBG product kept getting swapped or was sprayed with like a banned chemical. Next thing you know, this pet project thing I was involved in becomes a nightmare and I'm shelling out big dollars and dealing with the FDA and denaturing all these seeds on the Canadian U.S. border. And it just sort of like blew my mind on how difficult it is to figure out, you know, like we bought this cargo. What, how do we not know where it's coming from, what's happening to it in transit? And I just sort of serendipitously met my co-founder, Dr. Ellen Jorgensen at the same time, who was a pretty well-known synthetic biologist. And we just started brainstorming ideas on how we could solve this. And we landed on this idea of using essentially what's like a probiotic microorganism that's been deactivated. So it's not growing, it's not replicating, and it sort of contains a unique signature, unique DNA sequence. So when we apply it to food and ag products, we can trace it through the supply chain and detect it downstream and sort of just combining that with different characteristics that we can tweeze out of that same organism. We can do things like address pathogen growth. So actually kill pathogens, which is what we're working on now and different secondary functions. So all of this idea that with sort of a simple biological solution, we can address multiple problems in the first few miles of the supply chain. That last part you just talked about was a little bit new. We've been working on that for a while and we're just coming public with it. It's been like years in the work where we can get our tags to express what's called an antimicrobial peptide. So it has a bunch of other backend benefits, but one of the biggest ones is that not only can we tag something, but we can actually address some of the issues with it as well. Which would help with potential recalls. Correct. What's fascinating, there's so many applications for it. We see the opportunity as our tags are sort of this substrate, this infrastructure, and then we can have different value adds. Right now it's antimicrobial, which we've been working on for quite some time, but we see things as antifungals to address like aflatoxin or, I mean, really there's a whole universe of stuff we can look at. That's fascinating. There's so much going on in the U.S., I mean, around the world, but in the U.S. with food safety and the Food Safety Modernization Act, which I know you've heard of and many of our listeners have heard of. We've talked about it before on the show. The foods that are on the high risk list, the food traceability list, there's a bunch of them. Many of them are lettuces, there's cheeses. And folks are going to need to comply with this by January 2026. So 
you have a very technical way of getting ahead of this. Not everybody is going to be ready though, but can you just talk about the importance of food safety? You are way beyond just recognizing that there's a problem with food safety. You're solving it, but can you just talk about the importance of that for businesses and consumers as a whole? Yeah, I think this goes down to a couple of different things that we noticed empirically as well, which is that I don't think companies and businesses realize the hit to your bottom line when there is an event. You know, and I see that sort of manifest itself in two ways. Like one, there's a lot of like underinsureds, if you want to think about that. So you think, okay, I'm covered in, let's say, my product liability insurance or my general umbrella insurance. But a lot of these things are really specific and they may not be covered in your insurance program. You might not have an insurance program because it's a price sensitive business and you don't want to pay for that premium. But all of that can have a very dramatic impact on the business itself. Like we had one conversation where someone lost, they were sort of named in an investigation. It was like the precursor to the actual recall. They basically lost 30% on their top line revenue. And it took like two to three years to figure out that they weren't even involved. No insurance coverage on it. Like it was just a disaster. And it was basically them being blamed for something in a state that they didn't even sell product to. It's like, it's absolutely crazy, but this stuff happens. And our big thesis is that with climate change and warmer temperatures too, you're going to see a lot more pathogen outbreaks, just literally, it doesn't get cold enough anymore to sort of prohibit, let's say insects carrying viruses or pathogens or whatever. And so I think with more flooding, changing weather patterns, all this stuff, we could see a big increase in food safety situations. And I think it's just not getting the same amount of attention I think it needs to, the way other climate related issues are. Especially if you don't know where something has been. I mean, to lose 30% of your top line and you didn't even sell the dang product in the state, to even have that kind of information would save so much money. And I know that there are manufacturers out there and retailers, the retailers like, well, it doesn't impact us necessarily because, you know, the manufacturers are the ones that take the hit or I need to get the products off the shelves. So it's a whole supply chain problem. And you're right. I don't think there's enough attention being paid to it. So we're a biotech company. We're using biotechnology to address food safety because we think it's going to be an even more concern going for the future. But when we went to the market to commercialize, what we noticed is that, wow, like people really aren't prepared. Like there's huge swaths of this like $200 billion market of like meat, fresh produce, seafood, stuff like that, that has no coverage whatsoever. So we actually took it one step further and Hanukkah set up our own little insurance company where not only are we applying our technology, but we're actually using our technology to deliver more competitive pricing on faster insurance coverage. We wrote our first policy last month or a couple of months ago with the leafy greens grower out in Long Island. And we actually just raised about the equivalent of like a couple hundred billion dollars of insurance capacity where by partnering with an insurance carrier who understands that we can reduce the time it takes for a claim. We can make the whole process more efficient. And with our secondary function, sort of reduce the probability itself of that event happening. And so our idea is that Annika can really help mitigate the risk in this market, both on the technological side, but then also on the practical commercial insurance side of things. I wanted to jump in here if I could. My whole brain is blowing up here with what you're sharing. I mean, you come at it from a finance side. You just shared with us that you started an insurance company on the back end of a biotech company. I remember when I first met you in your facility there in New York, and the way I described it to people was, well, they've found this probiotic, which doesn't really do anything, but it's a marker. And they can go and crop dust fields, and then they can show provenance for those fields. And people are like, so what? I'm like, well, if you think about like a cotton field and provenance for the cotton to be used in medical solutions or in clothing or something else, but then the lettuce and the leafy greens and those types of things, make sure that they're not being mixed in with other things and you're getting what you paid for. Let's talk about food safety here just a bit. You mentioned temperature and climate change, which I didn't even give it a lot of thought to it. It was like a lightning bolt when you said it. But how has food safety evolved over the past decade, five years? And how is Annika's technology addressing some of these things? I keep bringing it back to like the insurance angle of it because that's where you get hit, right? I mean, it's really like the insurance company or the losses you're going to suffer as a result of bad practices. And what I'm always confused by is the lack of adoption, I should say. It's not so much what's changed, but like so much of it hasn't changed. 
we've got the ability now to read and write DNA and the curve at which that's possible is the only thing that's faster than Moore's law. So the idea of reading DNA, reading the human genome 20 years ago or in the 90s cost $8 billion and took literally 20 years. You can now do that for a hundred bucks in a day, less than a day. So why technology that is pretty standard in our industry isn't being adopted like left, right, and center to get ahead of all this stuff is beyond me. And so just to answer your question, I'd say companies are definitely doing more. I think one of the reasons you see more food recalls is just better diagnostics, better detection of stuff, right? So I think it's kind of good in a way, but then there's just a lot more technology that's sort of available that I think can be adopted, but is it for the very basic reason that this industry especially is like very complicated and no one knows whose problem it is. There's sort of like a diversion of responsibility aspect to it. Do you think FISMA will push adoption? I think it could. Depends on what the consequence of not being compliant is. If it's just like this really great theoretical document, but I don't get penalized in any way for like not complying, then I don't think it does. <laughs> no. Yeah, absolutely. There has to be consequences in some form or fashion. But like you said, the technology is there. There is a lack of adoption. There's a lack of adoption of Excel files, right? It's going to take something pretty drastic. And this could be it. It'll be interesting to see how it plays out in the next few years. That point was the main reason we launched this sort of insurance wrapper, because it's super difficult to have your technology adopted, especially something that's, like you said, like when Excel isn't being used properly, like what we're offering is just like two off the charts. But a more efficient insurance policy, which a customer does understand, is just easier in the whole cycle. And it's easier to get adoption on that. And then how we can offer that is sort of what our technology is. And you're then speaking in the same language. When you start saying biotechnology, well, just food safety is like, boom, we have car insurance, we have home insurance, we have insurance in our businesses. So yeah, that's a great point. And, and you might not understand that your insurance is like being priced off of using AI and using satellite images to take photos of your roof or whatever. There's a whole backend that's happening. But what difference does it make? You know, you're just understanding that you're saving money. I do have a question about the biology part. And I was working with you all several years ago, more on the periphery, about the technology that you're using. So from a layperson like me who understands more Excel and insurance, when you said earlier that you can track products to the supply chain, is there a reader? Like, how do you get the information? Yep. So this is like, you want to think of a very passive system. So you're playing a spray. That spray contains millions or hundreds of millions of little tags. That's the microbes. And then the way we're reading it, like when I say you can track it through supply chain, it's not like you open your app on your phone and you're getting like little pings across the country. It's more like when you've got your product, you can sample it and run, and I hate to make this comparison, but the way you would do a rapid COVID test, that same workflow is how you're detecting a yes or no, or there's sort of three layers of tests, depending on what you're asking. One, did it come from one of these places, which would be equivalent to like one of these rapid tests? Two, it's literally another qPCR test. So something that's more quantitative in nature. And then the third way is something called next generation sequencing, which just returns the whole barcode or the whole string of information that you put in. So are you only going to be testing if you think there's a problem? Yes, either sort of retroactively if there's an issue or if you want to validate that this is safe or validate that this is the product that you're buying. You've tagged these in one area or with one, let's say criteria, like you wanted these sustainable certified cacao beans or coffee beans. You could validate that at the port or whatever. Okay. So it's more passive. You have to wake it up. You have to do something like, I like actually the COVID test or something. You want to find something out. Yes. By testing it, then you can. And a lot of times, if you're talking about fresh produce, if there is a, let's say a food safety issue, that's going to be sent out or you'll do tests to see like, what's the problem? What's the contaminant? And that with that same protocol, you can say, oh, there's also a serial number on this. Instead of phone calls and emails on the non-existent spreadsheet that somebody is supposed to be, exactly. you can very quickly set out from field one, two, three. Yep. That's amazing. And so the idea is by like down all of that time and that headache, which can take several months, if not longer. Absolutely. And that's very dependent on people's memories too, right? As you start tracking a problem item back. I don't remember what I had on Saturday. 
nothing is perfect, but the idea here is like currently recalls are like two to three times wider than necessary. So if you can just start in the right place, you already have a huge leg up. So mm -hmm. we're not trying to replace UPC codes or, or the digital barcode or anything like that, but it's really just about bringing it all together. It's amazing. And it's so needed. <laughs> I think as you're talking to the fresh produce guys, and it'll be interesting to see how the one that you just started with the insurance, they're going to have so many learnings to, to be able to see where all this is going. Vishal, how does that play into recalls? Can you handle the recall situation or can you update the recall situation? Are you guys even focused in it at all? Yeah, we're all like hundred percent focused on it. So what we're trying to do is sort of be one of the first things that are looked at, right? So let's say there's a third party lab, they do their initial testing. We want to be that first, like, is there an Anika barcode on this thing? Let's look for that first as a first step. So we're making inroads on trying to get to that position. And one of that is sort of educating the different stakeholders. So trying to get on the radar of like FDA and CDC and the state labs and all of that, just so people know that, hey, this is a thing that can cut down our initial investigation time. And I just want to take that comment you said about an Anika barcode. You're really using that as a metaphor, right? And I just want because I've talked to people about this and they're like, wait, so they have barcodes or they not have barcodes or? No, it's not literally a barcode now. Yeah, but you can play into a system that pulls data from that and feed to that system. I mean, you're in essence using a biological DNA tag to tag your stuff the same way we put a printed barcode as a tag on an item. You're doing this with biology, and this is enabling us to move upstream, you know, in terms of where did it come from, other information that can be tied to it. I'm sure that your insurance side of this is how much rain did they get? What were the temperatures for the season? How long has it been in transit? Those types of things, you can still pull that from that, what I would call pre-production phase, right? Like lettuce, lettuce is in a field, it has to get harvested, then it has to get transported to distribution, then it has to get processed. And a lot of times, you know, if you're like me, you buy lettuce in the bag because I don't have time and I'm lazy and I'm not a good cook. My best friend and my wife, they'll go get the lettuce and the tomatoes and everything separately, chop it all up and make it nice. But that bag has a barcode on it, but you have all the information upstream from that. That's exactly right. And if you think of like a GS1 number, and those are all numeric. So all we're really doing, if you think about it, is we're converting that to like the language of biology, which is our ATCs and Gs. And so that's our barcode, so to speak. Or that's what I mean when I say barcode. It's a string of nucleotides that's just unique to that batch. And then we can fish that out. It blew my mind when I heard about it. And then when I saw it, and then Liz, I don't know that we got to this point, but when I was there, the DNA sequencer where they would actually grab a small sample and test it out to find the uniqueness that Vishal just talked about, it was the size of a deck of playing cards. And they would take some material, drop it in and let it run through and boom, off and done. It's not like I was envisioning, a, I don't know, like an electron microscope, some big thing that we'd have to do. But this was portable, quick and easy. So that's a sequencer that's called a nanopore. Annika did not create that. But since when you saw that piece of equipment, that thing's like 100 times better. That's how fast this is all going. The test that we developed is just a faster test that happens in minutes. It's really similar when you think about that rapid COVID test. But... Once you get into sequencing, which is what you just mentioned, all of the other ways we test for things, in my opinion, and one of the other questions is what blows your mind? Within the next 10 years, every other way that we look at something living or biological will be this one way, which is usually sequencing. And it's going to be lightning fast and like in the palm of your hand. That's inevitable. You're giving me visions of the Gattaca movie. That's exactly where we're going. I mean, the rate at which this stuff is developing is absolutely mind boggling. What it took to read the human genome in the 90s was as big as like our lab down. <laughs> when you look at what computing was with the Mark I and the ENIAC and all that stuff, it's just a similar trend, except for the fact that this stuff is happening at a much, much shorter time scale. This starts going into like personal nutrition, personal medicine, just like everything being for the individual person, only because you're going to be able to access information that no one's ever thought about before, right? Maybe on your desktop but in the next decade, who knows? But that's definitely the way, the trend that I see things going. It's amazing. It's going to be changing the way we live in our kids too. 
So when we look at our, our coding stuff, it's like, yeah, we're developing clever ways to test it out now, but it doesn't even matter because the way that we're going to be able to read DNA pretty soon, if Annika can have tags on everything, like that workflow is going to be lightning fast. And so the way I like to think about it, it's like if we barcoded stuff before the barcode reader, that's like how we're trying to get ahead of it, right? So kind of a similar journey here in terms of industries. When you think of the future of food safety and all of these different things, that we've talked about between the DNA tagging and the insurance and the killing different organisms. What do you see? Because you are on the cutting, cutting edge. So what else do you see out there in food safety? I think the biggest thing that we're going to see in practicality is the adoption of something like sequencing or, or the ability to detect pathogens in the processing line. I know a couple of startups that are working on that high throughput way of detecting things. It's not there yet, but like, I think that will be one of the biggest changes. And then on top of that, I think the adoption of things like, I mean, nobody wants to talk about GMOs and things, but there are huge values in all of that, right? There's a lot of value in making the food system more robust, not against just climate, but things like pathogens and things. So I think all of that sort of in aggregate is going to be what we see, not just one thing, but like the whole adoption of biotechnology. I think that's the era we're going into. And it's possible, by the way, because of all the other advancements in AI and computing power, we can have that biological revolution now because you need a lot of tailwind from it. Vishal, does this play into also validation of like, I'm looking at a package right now that says USDA organic certified. And I know that there's a lot of debate out there in the industry of there's more quote unquote organic product then we have organic, right? Like people are just throwing things on labels. Is this another way where we'll be able to verify that it truly is organic and hasn't been hit with pesticides or things like that? Or is that outside of the realm here? That's not like a huge use case for us, but it's, I mean, theoretically, it could be used for something like that. But again, I think in the future, just if you can read this whole other data set of information, I, don't, I think it extends way further than even like organic or not. But like, if you can really have genetic information at your fingertips translated in a way that's understandable, none of this will even matter, in my opinion. Liz, I don't know about you, but my mind is just completely blown. Like, <laughs> I, I'm so interested, excited, scared, nervous, optimistic. I remember three years ago is when I met Vishal. I might be even closer to four years ago now. Yeah, it, was, it was like right in the beginning, I think. Yeah. Yeah, because this was before COVID. I think when we met, it was just Ellen and I, and we had like one intern. Right, right. <laughs> that was like the whole team. And yeah, that was really early on. And a lot of this stuff was just theoretical. Now you have clientele that are using it. You have clientele that are even using your insurance side of it. The insurance side blows my mind because it makes so much sense. But often folks in our circle of things don't really go down that road of insurance. It's very interesting. It's really difficult. So it's funny, we were just accepted to a program at Lloyd's of London called Lloyd's Lab for like innovative ways to underwrite risk. But the basis of our whole thing is that it's really difficult to sell biology. It's really difficult to sell like any technology. That gap between what's possible and what's being developed versus what will be adopted is so big. And so what we tried to do is make the economics work where, hey, look, we can convert this thing that you don't understand, but we know you need into a way where you can understand the cost savings around that and like benefit from the cost savings. And that's all you need to know. We're basically bearing all of the technological risk ourselves because if our technology doesn't work, then we're just more likely to pay a claim or that's on us. But like, as far as the customer is concerned, you're taking no technological risk. You're not paying for any technology you don't understand. And all you need to really understand is like you're getting a discount or a better insurance program for you right now. And that's all that matters. And I think that's the real key element. And then how we see this is that there's amazing technology that's being developed that's outside of what we're doing, but we could theoretically fold that in as well. So if you've got abilities to address things like citrus greening disease or what's going on with bananas, or you've got a chemical free soil fertilizer or something that we think adds a lot of value, but is difficult to understand, we could theoretically design or incorporate that into insurance programs too. So we see this value of being at the intersection between biology and insurance is incredibly valuable, especially going into the next decade. All right. We're getting to the end here, Liz. We got to keep this moving. I'm just pondering so many things in my head. 
Vishal, we always close with two questions and I'm going to take the easier of the two, which is what's your favorite technology right now? What's something you're using either in your professional life or your personal life? But it's, it's just your favorite tech. So outside of all this biological stuff, but still kind of supply chain related, I'm really weirdly excited by exoskeletons. I'm just so fascinated by the fact that I think the entire manual workforce will be using exoskeletons. If not, like I think they probably already are. It just like intrigues me from both like the sci-fi aspect of it, but also I tried one recently, not too long ago. And my mind, like I was just blown away. When you pick something up physically and you feel that it's half the weight or 40% less, it means so much, right? It means that like people can work longer. It has all sorts of social implications on it. And it's not super out there and like cutting edge. And this is what, you know, it's like today. And it's a mechanical thing that I think is really going to have a huge impact economically and socially just because people can do more. It makes me think of all my Avengers favorite characters. Yeah, it's all that every toy growing up was like excess. <laughs> yeah, sex or something like and It's a cool to see it. I just watched, it was that one of our streaming services. It was the original $6 million man. That's like before my time. I think I've seen like maybe an episode of that. I remember growing up watching it and it was like, they literally called out, we're going to turn you into a cyborg. You'll be half man, half machine. You'll run faster, jump higher, see better. It was like, you know, every kid's dream, you want to be strong and fast and all that stuff. But we're seeing it now in our lifetime. Like, you're right. You're the first person to bring it. I saw the exoskeleton for the first time at CES back in like 2019. They were talking about how workers at the airport could take luggage off of the plane faster, quicker, easier. Military uses for lifting things. We don't need two people changing tires and some of the military vehicle tires are uh, pretty big. And this exoskeleton stuff, it's getting to the point where it's, you don't even see it on someone if they're wearing a jacket. It'll be on the outside of their clothes and you can just sit and it helps you stand longer. Especially as it gets, like you mentioned, the ones that we tried on were like little backpacks and they're getting smaller and stronger. So I just think it is really cool. Excellent. All right, Liz, I'll let you take us home here. Well, not to overuse the term blow your mind, but I know that both Reed and I have said that already. And actually, Rochelle, I think you have too. There's a lot of blowing your mind in this half hour from everything out there. And you're in the cutting edge of a lot of technology. So it might take a lot more for your mind to be blown than my mind to be blown. But what is out there that's blowing your mind other than the exoskeleton and other than all of the DNA tagging? Like what else is out there? I'm still fascinated that I can use my phone to pay for the subway. It's really basic. Like when I think about life now and what it was when I was growing up, when I look at my kids and their life, that's just so driven. And they talk to Alexa like she's part of our family. It's really creepy. We are like rely on it. It's weird. I guess I'm blown away with like how well technology is like integrating with everyday life. There's no line anymore. And that's always fascinates me. It's incredible. I will say this. I just came out of a meeting earlier today. And I love to hear the excitement. And I've been in IT for over 25 years and I've seen it as well. I had Wi-Fi in my house because I was lucky. I worked for a Wi-Fi company before people knew that it was even an option. And it would blow their mind when I would connect on my laptop to the internet and look up AOL. And they're like, you don't have a phone cord plugged in. I still think though, from a business standpoint on supply chains, we're not there yet. And we're not there yet because of the lack of standards for communicating. We have a bunch, but you have a supply chain that's regulated by one group and another one regulated by another group. And then another one that just pops up because nothing else was there. And we're doing D to C shipping direct to consumer type stuff. And people are like, I thought we always did this. I'm like, yeah, but that was, you know. Tom Smith and Mary who got together and started a business and started doing this. And now they're expanding and people are like, well, I need this information, need that information. And we take for granted that IT was exactly the same way only 20 years ago. And now they just build these technology stacks that work on top of each other. And I would really love to see, and we're starting to see it a little bit. I don't know if you're all familiar with um, Matter, but Matter is a standards group that got together for IoT devices. Now, it was led by Apple and Amazon and Google, but there's companies in there like Kroger that advise and others that are involved because they want to leverage the IoT as well, sensors and other stuff, but we need standards. And it just, 
I find that very interesting because Kroger grocery store, they were involved with the grocery industry being the leading generator of driving the universal product codes way back in the day, 50 years ago. Invention comes from places you often don't think. And I love seeing that. Well, listen, Vishal, thank you so much for joining us today. I think you've inspired, scared, all in the same breath. I can just see people, hear people, what about this, what about that? But I will tell you, if you're interested or have some concerns, I would just remind folks, get involved. I've met with these folks and I've seen what they're doing and see who they're working with. It's inspiring. It's inspiring to see the technology. It's inspiring to see the collaboration. And it's inspiring to see how you're really motivated to try to help the world. Because I don't know about you all, but uh, food's pretty important and I'm kind of hungry right now. <laughs> Love it. Thank you so much, Ruth. That was really nice of you. Appreciate it. All right. Well, thanks again. Have a great day. Thank you so much. Take care. Thank you for joining the Next Level Supply Chain with GS1 US. If you enjoyed today's show, you can subscribe to our feed or explore more great episodes wherever you get your podcast. Don't forget to share and follow us on social media. Thanks again, and we'll see you next time.